So we're going to look at the last part of the letter to the church at Colossae. So we're going to read the last 12 verses. We're going to begin at chapter 4 and verse 7. And it says this, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending to him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Anisimus, our faithful and dear brother, who's one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who's called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they've proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ, Jesus, sends greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he's working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. No pressure there, just publicly sort of telling Archippus that he needs to finish off what he's, uh, he's got to do. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Rather than expound this passage this morning, I, I want to just use that as a starting point to think about what it means to live as a church. I was walking across a bridge one day and I saw a man standing on the edge about to jump. I ran over and said, stop, don't do it. Why shouldn't I, he asked. Well, there's so much to live for. Like what? Are you religious? He said, yes. I said, me too. Are you a Christian or a Buddhist? Christian, me too. Are you Catholic or Protestant? Protestant, me too. Are you Episcopalian or Baptist? Baptist, wow, me too. Are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? Baptist Church of God, me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God or are you Reformed Baptist Church of God? Reformed Baptist Church of God, me too. Are you Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1879 or Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915? He said, Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915. And I said, die heretic and pushed him off. You, uh, many of you will have heard that joke before. Apparently in 2005, that joke was written by Emo Phillips. It was uh, voted by The Guardian as the funniest religious joke ever. I don't know in the last 17 years if there has been a funnier one. What makes it amusing is that it resonates with our lived experience. As Christians, we have so much in common, yet we find it so easy to divide from each other over small differences. Being church is not always easy. In this list of final greetings, we find in Colossians 4, there are two people mentioned here where there's a significant and difficult backstory. One is Anesimus, and we mentioned Anesimus um, a couple of weeks ago. That's in verse 9. Uh, Anesimus was a runaway slave. He'd then been converted. He spent time with Paul. And Paul actually wants his owner, Philemon, who's a Christian, he wants his owner to take him back, not only take him back, but actually to free him. And, and that's uh, something that is probably going beyond Paul's um, status to ask him to do this because of the society. But this is a, a debatable thing within the church. The other person is, uh, is a chap called Mark, who's mentioned in verse 10. And, and this is John Mark, who is probably the author of the second gospel. He's also Barnabas' cousin. And John Mark went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary trip, only to abandon them, I think it was at their second stop in Acts chapter 13, verse 13. We don't know why, we don't know whether he got scared or bored, or whether he was homesick, or whether he didn't like the food, or whether, as some of us have learned, that he got bad diarrhea, as happens when you travel to other countries. What we know is that Paul wasn't impressed. And when Barnabas suggests taking him along to revisit the churches from their first trip, 
Paul disagrees, saying Mark had deserted them. He doesn't want to take the risk again. And you read the story in Acts, it's in Acts 15, that Paul and Barnabas disagree so much, they have, actually the words that are used there about it, this heated argument, that they end up separating and going themselves separate ways. And what Paul does here in Colossians is, he, he has now come to value Mark, and he encourages the church to warmly welcome him. But all these stories tell us that life in church is not always straightforward. It's not always easy. Disputes happen, unity is something we need to work on. According to churchanswers.com, churches have split over a vacuum cleaner. Church members left one church because one church member hid the vacuum cleaner from them. Churches are split uh, over a fight whether to build a children's playground or whether to use a land for a cemetery. Churches have split over the types of coffee. Members left a certain church when they moved to a stronger blend. One church had a 45-minute heated argument over the type of filing cabinet to purchase, whether it was black or brown, two, three, or four door. These are such vital discussions. And, uh, and this one, which I've shared before, but another had an argument over the appropriate length of the worship leader's beard. That wasn't a problem this morning, we're glad to say. Church is not always easy. Disputes happen. And as a church, we have been discussing our collective position on issues of inclusion. And in particular, we've been discussing whether gay and lesbian people should be treated any differently from heterosexual people in being able to fully participate in the life of our, our church. I want to say three things to speak into our discussions this morning. The first is this. Unity must be a priority. Ever since Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg in 1517, the Protestant church's answer to difficulties has been to leave, to separate. I, I knew of a brethren family who worshipped on their own in their living room each week, having split from another family who they were worshipping with before over differences, and those two families had split from a small brethren church over other differences. Protestant Christians readily walk away from disputes rather than work through them. And I want to read to you some other words of Paul from his letter to the Ephesians, and he, he writes this. This is Ephesians 4, 2 to 6. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This says that if we are Christians, we are united. We are the same body, the same Spirit, the same baptism, the same God and Father of us all. But it is also realistic because it recognizes the challenges we face in maintaining our unity. In verse 3, it says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So there's a really strong word, this idea of making every effort. Commentator Marcus Barth says, it is hardly possible to render exactly the urgency contained in the verb translated make every effort. Not only haste and passion, but a full effort of the person is meant, involving their will, sentiment, reason, physical strength, and total attitude. He then says that the, the nature of the verb excludes passivity, quietism, or a wait-and-see attitude. Yours is the initiative, he says. Do it now. Mean it. You are to do it. I mean it. Such are Paul's overtones in verse 3. We are to work at unity. That's what it tells us. In the previous verse, we have the wonderful command, bear with one another in love. If you know the book of Ephesians, you know that Paul has some amazing images, metaphors about the church. He says that the church is the temple of God, the place where the Spirit of God lives. He says the church is the bride of Christ. He says the church is the body of Jesus. And yet he recognizes the reality of living life as church by issuing this basic command, bear with one another. 
This is actually how we do unity, is we put up with one another. We bear with one another. I remember when I was at my previous church on Sheppey, there were two Baptist churches on the Isle of Sheppey. Um, they had a long history of not working together. In partnership with the other minister, a friend of mine called Dave, we held a joint morning service. And I preached about whether there's a valid reason for these two churches that were just over a mile apart to remain separate. And I asked the question, why don't we join together and become one Baptist church? To which one of the older women from my church said quite loudly, not over my dead body. <laughs> Sometimes we are not willing to bear with one another. And yet unity is a very thing that Jesus prayed for us. The night before Jesus died in John's Gospel, Jesus prayed for all who would believe. And what does he pray? He prays for unity of those who would believe. Let me read it to you. John 17, verse 20. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. Why does Jesus pray this? I believe it's because unity is so hard to maintain within a church community because it's so difficult. I believe he foresaw the difficulties we would have in being united. And so given what Paul teaches in Ephesians, given what Jesus prays in John's gospel, unity must be a priority. And to leave a church can only be the last option when all other efforts to walk together have been exhausted. Let me say secondly, unity, though, is not uniformity. We can hold different views and still walk together. Romans 14 contains a passage where Paul discusses how people within the congregations in Rome held different views. Some felt that you couldn't eat certain types of food. Some felt that you had to observe certain religious days, Jewish religious days. Others disagreed entirely with that. And Paul laid down some principles as to how the church should deal with these differences. And the first thing is that Paul believed that there was a certain thing that was right. He didn't just say, well, these differences, there's no truth anyway, so let's just ignore them. Paul actually argues quite strongly that one side is right. But he says that we need to allow each other space within this. You see, I believe, the things that I believe, I believe are right. I believe I've, I've got it right on my theology. I did some areas where I question it, but I believe I'm right. You believe you're right, otherwise you wouldn't believe it. And actually, sometimes what you believe and what I believe is different. And what Paul would say in that is, is we should hold those convictions, but we need to find room for each other within them. It's not that there's no right answer, it's just that we don't understand what it is at times. And he teaches that, we need to stay true to what our convictions are, what our consciences tell us. Um, so what he says in, in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 14, he says, One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. Whoever abstains does so to the Lord and give thanks to God. See, his, his principle here is you have your conviction about what is right. There is truth, but we see it differently. You have your convictions. You need to live according to what your convictions say. You need to follow your consciences. And if you think, if there is um, a gay person who believes that, that they need to remain celibate, they need to do that. If that's what they believe, they need to follow their conscience. Otherwise, they will not end up worshipping God through the way they are living their life. And the same is true on all sorts of issues. Where, where we differ on things, we need to live according to what we believe is right as our worship to God. Otherwise, Jesus is not Lord of our lives. That's the point that he's making there. We live according to our consciences, to according to what we believe. And within that, I think we need to allow room for others to come to different conclusions, for others to believe different things. It's not that we don't discuss, we don't argue, we don't debate, but we don't insist on you having to come to the same conclusion that I have done. Uh, that I have done. Let me just show you this uh, cartoon um, 
about unity. Uniformity. And that's not what the church is. We're not simply to be the same. Actually, unity is different from uniformity. Many of you remember Tony. Um, Tony was a member of OBC, a dear brother in Christ. He sought to serve Jesus wholeheartedly. He died um, nearly two years ago from pancreatic cancer. Tony believed in the rapture, and he wanted me to teach people about the rapture, the belief that God would take up believers um, and gather them to himself, and then there'd be a time of persecution on the earth. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. So, so we would disagree, and we would talk about it at length. One time, we were in Sainsbury's, we met each other, and we had this heated debate about biblical verses for about half an hour, just at behind Sainsbury's. I don't know what people thought as they were walking past. Tony thought I was wrong, I thought Tony was wrong, and we'd try and persuade each other, and we didn't get very far. But at the end of our conversation, we hugged and we wished each other well, and we prayed for each other. Because unity is not uniformity. We can believe different things and still walk together as we continue to try and work out actually what is right before God here. We need to bear with each other, and we need to allow room for each other in Christ. And then thirdly and finally, and and perhaps most importantly, and this sums up the whole message of the Colossians, We need to live for Jesus. Jesus needs to be our Lord as well as our Savior. And we need to serve him in all our thinking and our behavior. The letter to the Colossians is about this. It's about Jesus being Lord. It's about us living our life under the Lordship of Christ. A fundamental understanding of church life and Baptist churches is expressed through the Declaration of Principle. This is in our constitution as a church. I've never preached on the Declaration of Principle before. There are three sections. The second one is about baptism. The third one is about mission. But the first one says this. Let's just have a look at it. That our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, is the sole and absolute authority in all matters pertaining to faith and practice as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. And that each church has liberty under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to interpret and and administer his laws. Listen to those words again. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is a sole and absolute authority in all matters. Where is our authority? Ultimately, it isn't actually Scripture. And ultimately, it isn't actually the Holy Spirit. What that says is that ultimately authority is Jesus Christ. Now, now don't hear me wrong on this, because we understand what Jesus Christ wants through Scripture and through the Holy Spirit, which the statement goes on to say. But he is our authority. So, So we come as individuals, we come to seek the mind of Christ on issues. We come and we seek what what is it you want us to, to do here? What is it you want us to believe here? What is right before you, Lord? And as we study scriptures, we listen to the Holy Spirit, as we listen to each other, we seek to work out what Jesus wants for us. He is the sole and absolute authority in all matters. And when we come to make decisions together, the Baptist church is, is constituted in a way that we are all to do that. We are all to seek God, to seek the mind of Christ, his will for us. And then we come together and we share what we believe is right before him. When we asked a question in, for our indicative survey about who should make this decision, only one of you said that it was a minister. You are good Baptists by saying that. You, you, uh, that wasn't me, by the way, who said it should be the minister, I just say. <laughs> only 11% actually said it was a leadership team, but three quarters of us said it should be the church members, and I believe that's how Baptist churches should work. We are all responsible to work out what is it that the Lord wants for us here, And then we share that and we listen to each other and we come to a decision, a collective decision, as we go through that process. Now, the Declaration of Principle, I mentioned this, it was was, um, derived back in the late 19th century because there was a dispute among Baptists at the time around an issue of salvation. And lots of Baptists believed at the time, they're called particular Baptists, they believed that you could only become a Christian if God had predestined you to become a Christian. And then there were general Baptists who believed that actually... Anyone who called on the name of the Lord could be a Christian. But there were two different ways of understanding how salvation worked. Both recognized that the other side were Christians. And so what they did was they found a way of accommodating these very diverse beliefs 
within one church, and they came up with this declaration of principle. Now, that was an issue around salvation. That was a fundamental issue of how people are saved. And at the time, the Baptist church worked out how to walk in unity through difference on that issue. And I actually think that the issue that we have is a lesser issue. It's an important issue, but it's a lesser one. And we need, and we should be able to walk in unity through difference on our issue. If they could do it then, I hope we can do it now. And so I just bring these thoughts as we come to the close of Colossians, because being church is not easy. Being church is hard at times. Paul taught us that unity is a priority. Jesus prayed for us that we would be united. Unity needs effort. It needs working at. We need to bear with one another. Unity does not mean uniformity, but we need to allow each other space for different convictions. And unity is found and it's expressed as each of us seeks to follow Jesus as Lord, just as Paul taught the Colossians to do. We're called to walk in unity, even in our differences. May we not do the Protestant thing of walking away when things are difficult, but may we do the Jesus thing of seeking to be one as he prayed for us to be. Amen.